Um, well, thank you, Deborah Zimmerman. You're here with us today in the CCTV studios. Yeah. And you uh, were awarded by the Vermont International Film Festival with the, let me get the words right, the Outstanding <laughs> Contribution to American Cinema Award. <laughs> yeah. um, it sounds so big. It is. It's a big deal. Yeah. You've been working for Women Make Movies. Tell me a little bit about that um, organization and how you came to do that work. Oh, gosh. It's a long story um, because the organization was founded in 1972. Um, I came to the organization in the late 70s. It was founded as, an, or, as a, uh, a collective to teach women how to make films because there were so few women that had the skills to actually make films that knew how to shoot a camera, use sound equipment. And for the first six years or so, seven years of the, of the uh, organization's existence, that's what it did. It had a workshop in Chelsea, which was a Latino neighborhood in, in uh, New York City. And they put up signs in churches and uh, neighborhood bodegas saying, come women, come muchachas, come nurses and housewives, come make movies. And they did. And they made all these really cool little short films. And who were the people that were involved in that? Well, there was a woman named Ariel Doherty and another woman named Sheila Page and another woman named Dolores Bartkowski. I didn't, it's funny, for many years I didn't know that there was a third person that was involved in founding the organization. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they just, now there's actually filmmakers that are more well known that weren't in the workshops, but were people that were actually, it, after the workshops, it became more of a, uh, of a, well, it was, it became more of an organization for not professionals, but for people, for women who wanted to make films, not yeah. so much neighborhood kind of, I mean, they made a film called How to Cut Up a Chicken. Yeah. They made a film about um, a neighborhood journalist. Um, and then some other filmmakers, some other film and women came, and now there's a woman named Greta Schiller who uh, has made a number of films and, oh. Yeah, just keep going. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm getting a little bit a little bit lost anyway. Well, um, so yeah. that I mean, it sounds a little like similar. It sounds like a similar origin story to like an organization like CCTV or community media. Yeah, it that, was. It was. Um, In fact, the yeah. women wanted they wanted to take on they wanted to, to to get I don't know what the word is get the license for the cable TV channel yeah. in New York. Yeah. yeah, it was very very community based. And where were their films being shown? Where were those stories being told? Just in neighborhood places yeah. in the same churches and not bodegas, but churches and high schools and outdoors. Yeah. yeah. And you grew up in New York at that time, is that right? No, 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 no. I grew up in Long Island. Oh, I was okay. born in New York City, but I grew up in Long Island. I went to school at New Paltz, upstate okay. New York. And I was there just for the very end of what was not the 60s, but was the 60s. New Paltz was, and Berkeley and New Paltz were the last two schools that over that were like really demonstrating, and we took over the administration building. We had a lot of fun. We wanted black studies. We wanted women's studies. We wanted, um, yeah, to th things to change on campus. And um, as a result, I ended up having a fantastic, wonderful uh, teacher named Alice Fix, who said to taught. I had a class in feminist theater and another class in, this is, I haven't told the story, and another class in violence against women. I mean, you know, this was 1974, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, and she said, you know, you're interested in film. I was studying film and I was studying women's studies. So she said, you have to go to this women's weekend. It was women, W-O-M-Y-N. Uh -huh. um, it was a cultural weekend for women. and. Uh, she said, there's this group called Women Make Movies. And I went, and they were showing a film in a barn, and there were all women watching this movie that was, that was about women, feminists. It was like the first time I saw a film that actually reflected my life uh -huh. on screen. And I thought, wow, if I could do this, I'd be really happy. <laughs> what was, was there something in your upbringing? Was there something in you that brought you to that? Was it the, um, the world in which you were swimming? Well, you know, it, it is so interesting. There's always people who I think have 
an oversized influence on your life. I had a friend, she was just a very, very good friend. In fact, I still know her. We just spoke on the phone for the first time in many, many years last week. And her mother was a real feminist. Her mother was an, an activist. She was a political activist. And we went to Washington demonstrating against uh, the Vietnam War, moratorium days. And I canvassed for the farm workers. And I just became very political. And I was, I was a baby feminist. And it was seared into me. Um, and then when I went to school, went to university, I met this guy who was just a friend, not a boyfriend or anything. It was an art school. New Paltz was an art school, and he was an artist. And I never thought that I'd be involved with art, but he made me believe that art was the most important thing in the world. And I put, I couldn't draw, so I thought, hmm, movies. <laughs> I, was a, I was an AV club in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up getting a job as a projectionist and seeing all these films and I put together a major. I had to like create my own major because I wanted to take art classes, but I wasn't in the art department. And long story short, I ended up studying film and I knew that I wanted to work in film, but I also was so, my feminism was so strong that I didn't want I didn't want to do it without also working with women. Uh -huh. And there was really only two organizations that I knew of. One was Women Make Movies, and the other was Women's Institute for Freedom of the Press. I was also I was very involved with, I created a major in communication studies, and I was very involved with freedom of the press. And, and actually, New Paltz was in the Hudson Valley in New York, and the Hudson Valley was very underserved by, um, by media because there was no cable then. And it couldn't get a signal from New York. So there was, there was, no, local, new, there was no local news, except for radio. Um, and then these channels started. And anyway, it was, it was, I got very involved with um, the FCC and regulations about how media was, gonna, was being controlled. And when the, uh, not the, was it the Fairness Doctrine? I think it was the Fairness Doctrine. Yeah, or the, when, yeah. the Cable Act, 1986 Cable Act, maybe? Yeah, no, 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 it was before the Cable okay. Act. Um, my, I, I had a job going to the local radio stations and the television stations that had gotten started to look at their rosters to see how many women <laughs> and how many blacks were employed and what the content of the programming was. Cool, um, interesting. So yeah, so my, my interest was uh, very much a political orientation. It was very mission. It was very mission based. Yeah. Um, I. It was artistic, but it was also about why the films were being made and what kinds of films were being made. And so for a while, I worked in production. But you know, it just uh, the last film I worked on, Robert Duvall was directing, and he was so sexist and so creepy and so. It had no content, you know, yeah. just no content. So I went back to, I'd, I'd been an intern at Women Make Movies when I got out of school. It took me about three months of riding my bicycle in front of the building where Women Make Movies was before I knocked on the door and said, I just want to be an intern. <laughs> you would ride past yeah. and be like, yeah. should I stop, should I stop? And Absolutely. then you finally did. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I was nervous. It was so important to me yeah. that it, yeah, it took yeah. me a really long time. And now, 40 years later, <laughs> it's still my life. Yeah, so you've been, you've sort of grown up in that organization Absolutely. and done a lot. Absolutely. Um, you know, when you're talking, you're sort of touching on, it, and it seems like the silliest question to ask, but why is it important to make, why is it important who's controlling <laughs> the camera and making this movies and telling the story? Well, I just came from teaching a class at the university on exactly that. Um, you know, there's so, there's so many reasons, but I think the most important one is that, well, I say that women make movies, the films that we distribute, because we are a distributor, we're the largest distributor of films by and about women in the world, um, that we distribute films for empowerment and, sub and subversion. Um, we distribute films to give women a vision of themselves that they don't often see, um, 
to empower them, in order to create their own lives, in order to learn about things, to, in order to, to, to feel in a different way, for young women to see role models, to see strong women, to see women who are complex and complicated and, and not just the blonde bombshell, not just the housewife. I mean, it sounds like that's old, but it's not. If you look at the statistics, it's still unbelievable. 31% of the people speaking in films are women. That's one third of the speaking parts are women. That to me is just so astounding. The idea that in 2023, that if you go to the movies, and by the way, you know, women do not even make up one third of the directors making films in the United States. It is, it's gone down in 2015, 2000, sorry, 2015, it was 15%, 15% of the 1,500, let's say the 1,500 largest films being made. And in 2022, it went down to 8%. So what are girls seeing when they go to the movies? Let's not talk about Barbie. <laughs> or, or let's talk about Barbie. Yeah, if you want to talk about Barbie, talk about Barbie. Um, but the other part, so, the, so that's, that's one part. The other part, and actually, well, Barbie... I, can, I could use Barbie. The other part is subversion. You know, the other part is getting films to people who need to see the films. They don't know that they need to see the films, but they do. Did you think there was anything subversive about Barbie? I, well, I'll, I will get there in one oh, okay. second. Let me just finish that thought, and then I'll, then I'll go to Barbie. <laughs> yeah. So and it's interesting because I was telling you that I was just in Finland, and I had a very interesting discussion about Barbie with the students in Finland. Um, but when women make movies after these... I'll kind of go backwards to go forward. So after we made all of these, or I wasn't in the organization at the time, when, when they made all of these short films out of these workshops, they collectively made a film called Health Caring from Our End of the Speculum. And it was really kind of like our bodies, ourselves on film. When that film, nobody, it won a blue ribbon at the most important educational film festival in the US, but nobody would distribute it. They said there was no market for it. So the organization started dis distribution with that film. And it was very, very successful. And when that film got used in film school, in, sorry, in medical schools and doctors would be having an opportunity to hear women talk about their health issues from their own perspective, that's subversion. You know, that's like getting a message out. And that was 1976 that film was made. This year or last couple, two years ago, well, we just we have a film that's being that we're releasing now called Neurodivergent, which is about women and um, invisible disabilities. We have another film called Belly of the Beast, which is about women in California who are shackled in prison when they're giving birth um, and miscarry because of it. Uh, there's still this, the, there are so many issues that still have yet to be seen in mainstream media, dealt with in mainstream media, that are so important. So, yeah, so that's subversion. So now, Barbie, is Barbie subversive? Well, the interesting thing about it is that when I, I hated the film. I mean, I just, I, I was appalled. I was appalled that it's the most successful film ever made by a woman. I was appalled that it was still the same image of a tall, long-legged, beautiful woman in the center of the story. Um, but when I asked my staff, who had, you know, everybody had seen Barbie, like how many liked it? Everybody was like, well, you know, it's, it's feminism light. But one of them said, I went with my 11 year old brother and it, actually it was really great because he, it kind of opened his eyes a bit. And then somebody else said, I went with my mother who's not a feminist and it actually had an impact on her. That's subversion. Like when I was in Finland and I talked to these young, these young high school students, they also were very, they were critical in the same way that I was critical, but they also talked about how important it was for these issues just to be talked about. And the, the one scene that kept on coming up, which happens to be one of the scenes that I really did like in the film, was when Ken um, thinks that he can be a doctor, even though he has absolutely no training, right? But he's mansplaining, he's like, yeah, he's gonna go be a doctor, just because he's, yeah, he can be a doctor. 
And that idea of how men see themselves and see the world and how they act in the world and how different it is, I think is, is actually a bit subversive because it isn't really, you don't see that in a whole lot of Hollywood films. So you're just too far ahead of your time still. <laughs> I don't know. Well, look, you know, things have, they've gotten so much better than, it, than they were. But, and people, but people still ask me, you know, what about men make movies? And I still say it, it, men do make movies. It's called Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, there have been amazing accomplishments. But as I said before, the statistics are still really, really bad. So were we ahead of our time? No, I think we were behind our time. You know, there were three women that were making films in the United States mainstream films or Hollywood films from 1930s to the 1960s. Tell me a little bit about some of the films that have gone through Women Make Movies. Sure. That you sure. So as I said, Women Make Movies is the largest distributor of films by and about women, and we distribute mm, more than 700 films. But we can also, I, wait, can yeah. I just interrupt? So yeah. there is a question also. I'm just curious how you approach the term women in the days of. Um, <laughs> oh, that's such so, a, that's, that's so loaded. <laughs> is it? I'm sorry, I don't mean it to be loaded. I just, you know. It's okay, it yeah. is. It is loaded, it's hard. Um, it's hard because we are, well, we say that we distribute films that are by women and, and women identified people. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the short answer. Yeah. So it's an inclusive, it's it an inclusive idea. Absolutely, absolutely inclusive. Womanhood. Yes, yeah. okay. it, it is very much. And it's very much, you know, gender is really important. I do have to say that I think that it's very complicated because I, th I actually was teaching for a semester at Rutgers and it is very hard to teach about the representation of women without using a binary. So the idea of how fluid gender is becomes very, it's, it's difficult. Um, it's, com it's just complicated. Yeah. And I, it's okay. You, that's you all fine. Can continue. You were about, you were talking about the, some no, of the that's movies fine. you've distributed. And yeah, no, what I wanted to say is that, that, um, so we distribute <laughs> films made by and about women. Um, but we also have a production assistance program. And in the production assistance program, we work with women who are in production trying to help them get their films made. And the reason for that is it's, it's a vestige of the workshops that we did. And I just want to give a little bit of history because I think it's kind of interesting. So when I came to the organization as an intern, I then ended up as the director. And I became the director because it was the director of nothing. The organization had been very nicely funded by a program called CETA, which was the Comprehensive Employment Training Act that Carter put in um, when he was president. And when Reagan came in, he decided that women had already accomplished enough, right? And there was no need for this, the part of the National Endowment for the Arts for the program that funded women. So they just got rid of it and we lost our funding. We also were having a great difficulty in the state, state arts council as well. And the organization just about went under. So I was able to become the director of, of an organization that was basically falling apart. <laughs> um, but there was, it was really interesting going back to this notion of community because we had a, a series of meetings. I was a volunteer then, and we just said anybody that wants, has had anything to do with the organization that wants to come to a meeting, come to a meeting. And enough people came and said, this was so important in my life that we decided that we'd try to figure out how to keep it going. So the way that we did keep it going was that we decided to focus on distribution because at that time when there were lots of women making films but they weren't getting out, oh. distribution actually brought money in so it was an earned income program. And I gave up a very well paying job at a foundation and when I took the job at Women Make Movies I said I don't want to rebuild an organization that's dependent on non-feminists deciding to give us money. So I rebuilt it along with a fantastic board and other people as an earned income organization. And we've been very unusual like that. So even since the 80s, 85% of our income is from earning, it's mm -hmm. money that we earn from licensing mm -hmm. and renting films. Um, but we always wanted to maintain our commitment to helping women to get their films made. So we created a, a workshop program 
that was more about the business side of the business. Um, how do you raise money? How do you market your film? How do you clear rights? We were talking about uh, fair use and, and rights for films. Um, and through that, we ended up supporting uh, a filmmaker named Julie Dash, who made a very important film called Daughters of the Dust, which was the first film by an African-American woman to be distributed theatrically in the country. And we helped her raise money for the film. And through that, we broadened it myself and a woman named Michelle Mater. Unfortunately, she passed away last year, but she was a tremendous visionary and just an extraordinary person who um, I worked together with for many years. And she stayed with us. She was on our board um, when she passed away. Uh, she ended up, she was actually one of the reasons why it got theatrically distributed because she ended up working with Julie on the, on the distribution of Daughters of the Dust. But anyway, so um, we started this production assistance program together. And through the years, more than 3,000 women have gotten uh, support from the program. We work with them to look at their proposals, to introduce them to funders, to do these webinars and workshops that give them the background that they need, networking, all kinds of things, that whatever, whatever people need. And we've, we really feel like we've seeded the field because filmmakers like Lena Dunham, her first film was sponsored by us, Dee Reese, who ended up making Mudbound and actually was the first African-American woman to be nominated for Best Screenplay, who hired a woman cinematographer who was the first woman cinematographer nominated for an Academy Award. Um, so, yeah, many, many, many different kinds of women. Some of those films end up in distribution. So in the production assistance program, we'll support women making films about anything. Citizen Four by Laura Poitras is a film that was in our program, but nothing to do with women. Um, but other films like the film that, uh, actually we didn't sponsor uh, the film that we showed last night. I just spoke about a film called Coded Bias, which is about artificial intelligence and the way that it's biased against people of color. Mm. Um, it's actually available on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And we also distribute it, which is very unusual, but I'm really glad that we're able to. Um, that was a film that was in our production assistance program that we then uh, ended up distributing. Yeah. Um, Are you finding, so something has come up, um, you know, there's been questions around Netflix and Amazon <laughs> and, um, you know, all of the, all of these large, um, Companies, media conglomerates, media conglomerates <laughs> um, who are now in the business of documentaries and movie production. Kind and of. I wonder if you want to talk about that and sure. what the impact has been on you, good, bad, and also sort of the ethics of documentary make documentary yeah. filmmaking mm. from that point of from the point of view of like when you get a lot of money involved in it. Interesting. Um, Interesting is that questions. Something that you're thinking about. Of course, of yeah. course. And in, and to be fair, you're distributing both um, narrative films and documentaries. No, mostly right? documentaries. Okay. No, we started out actually distributing some fiction films. Daughters of the Dust is. Well, we we didn't distribute Daughters didn't, of the Dust. Okay. No. Okay. No, we distribute Julie's first film. One of, we distribute her earlier works which were three very short Hers films. Are feature films, so mostly, right? Or well, now she makes, but okay. she, started out, she started out with a film called Illusions, which is a really a wonderful 40-minute yeah. film. And that we distributed uh, Jane Campion's short fiction films. So we'll, we, that's what I mean about how we work with filmmakers at the beginning of their careers. Got it. Some stay with us and yep. continue to make independent documentaries um, or, in, yeah, documentaries. Okay. Some go on to Hollywood, some go on to make very, very big, you know, not to distract films. you from the big question of ethics. No, 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 yeah. no, no. Because it, it, has, it is actually, it's interesting. We made a decision to not um, distribute fiction films because we really wanted to be able to work with as many women as we could. And fiction and theatrical distribution, you know, you can really only do about six films a year. Where at the time, we were doing like 30 to 40 short films. Mm. And really, we felt having an impact more on our on our commitment to, the, to equity in the, to not just in the industry, but to what we see. But it doesn't really, so, okay, so this is connected to the streamers because what the streamers have done is given documentaries a bigger platform. Yep. And in that way, it's really great. But I will tell you a funny story that I met Ted Sarandos, who's the, C, I think, COO or 
I don't know, CEO of, of Netflix, um, when nobody knew what Netflix was, there was a conference in, in Washington and there was about 30 of us talking about distribution and he talked, I have this company <laughs> called Netflix <laughs> and it's, it's using, I don't think we used the word algorithms then, you know, it's the idea of if you like this, then you'll like that. Mm -hmm. um, and he really wanted to, dis he wanted women make movies, films on Netflix. And I said no, <laughs> which he did not like. <laughs> But I, I hold to my decision because I knew back then that there was something that was not going to be good for independent filmmaking in this. Um, Why? And what's not good about it? What's, what's not good for independent filmmaking? What's not good for independent filmmaking is that you're basically, it's the conglomeration and the global audience. That when you're trying to reach everybody, you have to have a certain kind of product. And that kind of product oftentimes is not independent. It's oftentimes not an alternative to mainstream media. It is mainstream media. And of course, what happened is they started out with, you know, whatever they could buy, but then very quickly became the most commercial products that they could find. They only started buying documentaries because they were out of other stuff to buy and because it was cheap for them to buy them. And they were going global. Yeah. Um, and by the way, they've stopped. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, it's so interesting to think of what is mainstream media. Mainstream media is whatever is mainstream media. Yeah. Right? And then, <laughs> I mean, that sort of gets back to the Barbie. When I'm, uh, you know, the first thing I did after watching Barbie was I went and looked. I was like, how much is it going to cost to buy that Ken t-shirt? Yeah. Which is definitely There you me. go. That's the point like, of it. It's like, isn't that the whole point of this? That is the point of and it. And then I'm sort of left like, I love that rant in the middle, but what... What's the real bottom line point of all of this work that we're doing? And if it's not about being in community yes. with each other yeah. and about shifting and building on our culture and growing as humans together, then I, you know. Well, look, there are, there's definitely, I, can't, I completely agree with you and I can speak to that. But I also do want to say that there is something wonderful about having films like Coded Bias on Netflix. Yeah. You know, we have a film called Invisible Beauty that we sponsored. It's a fantastic film about Beth Ann Hardison, who was kind of the first, she was Halston's first black model and who's been an activist her life, fighting for diversity in, in women in the fashion industry, women models. And again, about the representation of women. It's going to be on HBO Max, or I guess they call it Max now. You know, these kinds of films that are able to reach really large audiences it's really important. The problem is, is the model of conglomerate. Because what happened is, is that after Netflix and Amazon and the companies that you know, there are now these educational conglomerates called Canopy and Alexander Street Press. And um, well, the other one is owned by independents. But, and basically, universities now pay a certain amount of money for access to this collection. And we get a teeny tiny amount of money, which we share with our filmmakers, and they get an even teenier tiny bit of money. And the professors, this is really interesting, in terms of what do people, what university, what do people see, you know, I do believe, like you do, that seeing films in community is so important. And I've always been very committed to the idea that we're reaching students because education, we do a lot of educational distribution. You're reaching college age students, but at a time in their lives when they actually are very open to ideas and where you can really influence them. And seeing films in a classroom at the same time or seeing films in community groups or even in theaters at the same time has a very different impact than watching something when you're home in your apartment by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but now what? Okay, I kind of lost my little train of thought there. Um, well, we're talking yeah. about the con we're talking about oh, the, the conglomerate. conglomerate. Yeah. Right. So the economics yeah. of these streamers and the economics of conglomerates are that what ends up happening is that organizations like Women Make Movies or independent distributors can no longer function in the way that they used to because, as I told you, we're an earned income organization. We depend on that income. We believe that. Getting income to our filmmakers, it, it, it's part of what our mission is, um, and it's very much threatened by this, by this, this model of 
conglomeration, and I know where I was going, and I don't want to forget it because it's so important. The way that it works within universities is that it gives the decision making, and this is kind of fascinating, it gives the decision making over to the mass. The masses, meaning the students. So if a film is watched a certain amount of times, if there's a number of clicks, then the university has to license it. Mm. So what gets licensed? Things that get clicked. Things that have sex in it. Oh, okay. Things that are commercial. Yeah. Things that are that they could actually Familiar. that yeah. that they can get in other places, but rather than a, a, something you're going to watch once in a classroom. In a classroom, classroom rather yes. than something that the professors yeah. and the librarians, yeah. rather than the kinds of books that librarians buy, not because they're going to be used a lot, but because they're important yeah. for a university library to have those yeah. books. The decision making was taken out of the hands of librarians. And that's that's not good. That's not good for anybody. Yeah. Um, it doesn't it doesn't hold up. I mean, it is. We're all swimming in capitalism. Yeah. And the, and, you know. The yeah. Pluses and minuses. We're. I can't think we've gone well over thirty minutes now, and we're. <laughs> this we could keep going. On we could. And on. Um, I just I do want to. This is the first time you've come to Vermont to VTIF. Have you gotten to see some films while you're here? I am going to say There's something like amazing about VTIF. V, v, you V-tiff. all you V-tiff. all call it Vermont VTIF. International yes, no, Film I know Festival. what it stands yeah, for. Yeah. It's just like VTIF. Yeah. Um, it's sweet. Um, I have been absolutely amazed at the quality of the films that they're showing in the festival, which. But it means that they're films that I've just recently seen at the New York Film Festival. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I happen to be extraordinarily busy right now yeah. um, because Women Make Movies just moved and I'm about to go to Amsterdam for the Documentary Film Festival there. So I haven't seen, I saw, um, did I see any films today? No, I'm going to see a film tonight. I'm going to see the Iranian film tonight. Yeah. Um, and I will just say to anybody who's watching this, Go see the films. They're fantastic yeah. films. And you're seeing them with a nice group of people. Yes. As we're talking about it. Like, you really are seeing them in community with other folks. It's true. So I really enjoyed I just want to say that I really enjoyed, um, we had a film screening last night, which I think you yeah. saw. Esther uh, Newton, Esther made, Newton, gay. Esther yeah. Newton made, made Me Gay. Yeah. And I enjoyed seeing just a bit of it with that audience because yeah. I think that it was it was well received. Um, yeah. yeah. That, that was a fascinating um, story and about how literally that whole idea around how you tell a story to change the culture because you pay attention to the culture and by paying attention you know you, you anyway that's, <laughs> I, I can't, that's why I ask questions and not try to answer them but Deborah what's next for you next you're headed off but what's mm. next for women make movies and what's next for you oh my goodness you? what's next we're always so it's crazy um, we've been madly looking at films and we've seen some really amazing films that I can't talk about yet because we don't have the rights to them. Um, but I'm very excited about the films that are coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see if there's some that I can talk about that just came out of our production assistance program. There's a wonderful film about Nikki Giovanni, um, that I believe was bought by... Oh goodness! It's going to be on. It's going to be on one of the streamers. Mm -hmm. um, it's by a wonderful filmmaker named Michelle Stevenson. Um, I'm of course going know blank. More, well, that's okay. But if yeah. people want to know more, I mean, obviously we have the we have internet. a website. We, we have website. a website. Women make movies. Wmm dot com. And is there another pro? Is there a sort of semester or program that people can get involved? Actually, right now yeah. we have a we're we are running a series of virtual film festivals. Okay, great. Uh, and right now we have one on media literacy. Oh, oh, it's a great Fantastic. great subject. Yeah, great subject. Yeah. Um, and we're showing something like seven to ten films. Completely free. Anybody who wants to see them can see them. Oh, maybe we'll um, put together a screening here. You could do, do that. You could absolutely do yeah. that. Just go onto the website and take a look at them. Great. Deborah, thanks for coming in and spending some time, and congratulations on your award, Outstanding Contribution to American Cinema. And for those of you who haven't gotten a chance to um, check out um, Women Make Movies website and also the Vermont International Film Festival, we're at about day five of, we're halfway through the film festival, but um, there's still stuff going on. Thanks for watching.